Hi, I'm Dan, and this is my video about the early days of G. Fox & Company, which became the greatest of the department stores in Hartford, Connecticut. I'll be talking about the store's first 60 years, a period when it grew from a one-room fancy goods store into a large department store, occupying several connected buildings on Main Street. I'll end this video by talking about the Great Fire that in 1917 destroyed those buildings. In another video, I'll continue with the story of how G. Fox rebuilt with the construction of an 11-story building that is still a Hartford landmark today, and then I'll talk about the store's continued expansion through the 1960s. For most of its history, G. Fox & Company was run by three generations of the same family. First, there was Gerson Fox, who came to America as a boy from Germany. He was succeeded in leadership by his son, Moses Fox, who led the store for 48 years and saw it through the devastating fire and the Great Depression. Moses Fox was followed by his daughter, the Hartford legend Beatrice Fox Auerbach, who led G. Fox through the years of World War II and undertook the last major physical expansion of the store in 1960. She sold the company in 1965 and it eventually closed in 1993 after over 140 years in business. Before we start, if you enjoy this video, please consider hitting the like button. And also, I would greatly appreciate it if you would consider subscribing to my channel. Then you can hit the bell button so that you don't miss any of my latest videos. So here is part one of my history of G. Fox and Company. So let's start back with Gerson Fox, a Jewish immigrant from Bavaria. He came to Hartford in 1830 and began business as a peddler. He eventually started a store in the 1840s at 126 and a half Main Street with his brother Isaac under the name I and G. Fox. They sold fancy goods which included notions and general merchandise. Isaac soon moved to New York and Gerson continued the store, moving further up Main Street to a location just south of Christ Church. It was a gambrel-roofed building that was later replaced by the Roberts Block. When the Roberts Block was about to be built in 1866, Fox moved across the street to 412 Main Street in the Averill Building. This was an old building which I'll talk about more in a few moments. In 1881, G. Fox moved just south of the Averill Building into a new four-story building erected just north of the Cheney or Brown Thompson Building. As shown in the picture on the left, the 1881 G. Fox and Company Building replaced an earlier building on the site that had once been the home of lawyer Cyprian Nichols, it had been one of the earliest brick houses erected on Main Street. The 1881 Fox Building, erected for $65,000, was designed by architect J. Bachmeyer. It was built of Philadelphia pressed brick with Ohio stone trimmings and was surmounted by an elaborate metallic cornice. As was typical for a dry and fancy goods store of the time, the G. Fox store initially only utilized the basement, first floor, and half of the second floor, with the remaining space being rented out for offices. G. Fox would only take over the entire building in 1886. Sadly, Gerson Fox did not live to see this growth, as he had died in 1880, just before the building was completed. G. Fox and Company was taken over by his son, Moses Fox. Born in 1850, Moses had left the Brown School at the age of 13 to join his father in the business. The company would grow substantially during his many decades in charge. The 1881 building went through substantial alterations in 1890 to designs by the architectural firm of Cook, Hapgood & Company. 
Among the modernizations was the installation of an Otis elevator. As the Hartford Current newspaper reported on July 4, 1890, describing the interior, quote, The aisles on the floor are wide, the seats attractive, and the heating pipes are carried under metal footrests so that in the winter ladies can be comfortably warmed while shopping. A luxurious drinking fountain is set near the elevator, and the easy and handsome staircase is also close at hand. An entirely new feature in these alterations is the spacious bay window of plate glass in the second-story front, consisting of three projecting sides, 11 feet wide and 12 feet high. The large lights will be pivoted so as to be readily opened in hot weather. Unquote. The store would soon expand to the north. Back in 1881, what would become the main street frontage of the G. Fox building we know today was occupied by three structures. One was the Fox building I just talked about. Next north was the Averill building, which had been the home of G. Fox from 1866 to 1881. The building was actually two houses built circa 1824 that had been joined together and converted into commercial space. In 1881, the lower floor had been remodeled with the George O. Sawyer dry goods store in the center storefront occupying half of each house. North of the Averill building was a four-story brownstone building known as Owens Block or the Metropolitan Building. It contained stores below and a boarding house above. From 1878 to 1881, its north storefront had been home to Pratt and Baldwin Morning Goods. Since 1865, the building had been owned and rented out by Talcott and Post, who had a dry goods store at the corner of Main and Pratt Streets. In 1881, Talcott and Post split up, with C.M. Talcott continuing the dry goods business at Main and Pratt, while William H. Post brought the former partner's carpets, curtains, and wallpaper business to the Metropolitan Building. He took over the building's entire storefront space and erected a rear annex addition in 1889. As the Current reported on April 11th of that year, quote, out-of-town visitors have frequently expressed to the writer their surprise that a city the size of Hartford could boast of an establishment so complete in all of its details as that of William H. Post and Company. The beautiful and artistic articles kept in stock by the firm for house decoration are fully equal to those found in similar establishments in the great cities, and some visitors say that in point of taste and originality, W. H. Post and Company are far ahead even of their New York competitors. Unquote. Sadly, Post would go bankrupt just three years later. Just north of the Post building was a colonial house on the corner of Main and Talcott Streets. It was erected circa 1725 by Joseph Talcott, who was governor of Connecticut from 1724 to 1741. Later serving as a commercial building, the house was demolished in 1900 and replaced with a Woolworth store. On January 9, 1887, a devastating fire destroyed the Averill building. It started in the rear of the G.O. Sawyer & Company dry goods store near the furnace. The remodeling I mentioned that took place in 1881 had removed the heavy interior walls on the first floor, replacing them with a few iron pillars to support the heavy upper floors. This made it very dangerous for the firefighters inside with the risk of collapse. The fire was also able to gain headway initially because of frozen fire hydrants. A popular reporter for the Hartford Times, Thomas R. Lawton, died from smoke inhalation after he had entered the burning building to try and ascertain the origin of the fire. The ruined structure was soon replaced by a new Averill building. This is a view of the east side of Main Street in the 1890s. 
North of the Cheney Building, it shows the 1881 G. Fox Building I've already talked about. North of that was the new Averill Building, designed by J.G. Glover of Brooklyn and had an Odd Fellows Hall on the upper floor. In 1891, the building was acquired by Moses Fox, who for a time continued to lease space to the building's tenants, which included George O. Sawyer, R. Ballerstein's Millinery Store, and the Charter Oak Lodge of Oddfellows. By the end of the 1890s, R. Ballerstein and Company had moved into its own new building further south on Main Street, and George O. Sawyer had moved to a building at the corner of Main and Asylum Streets, a site where Hartford's first skyscraper would be built in 1912 for the Hartford National Bank. Last to vacate were the Odd Fellows in 1902, which allowed G. Fox to occupy the entire Averill building. This is a section from the Hartford Atlas of 1909. It shows Fox's properties at the time. First, along Main Street, there's the 1881 building and the Averill building. Fox's was also expanding north of Talcott Street. In 1907, it erected a four-story storage building designed by Isaac A. Allen, Jr. In 1913, the store opened a new employee cafeteria in a former tenement across Talcott Street. The Hartford Current at the time was very impressed that the shop girls could now save both time and car fare going home for lunch. A notable feature of the new cafe was affordability, with a variety of sandwiches available for three cents each, a piece of pie for four cents, and cereal for six cents. Hot soups were to be added to the menu soon. As the Current reported on November 18, 1913, quote, The employees are rapidly becoming acquainted with the advantages afforded them by the new lunchroom, and although it was only opened Wednesday, more than 150 were served Saturday, while more than 400 were served that evening. The rooms are so attractive and the eatables so inviting that it has been hard work to keep the general public out. Those in charge there have been constantly called upon to explain why the service is so exclusive, and some persons have turned away with an air of injured pride to think they couldn't partake of the advantages there. The seating capacity is 60. The tables, chairs, etc., and other furnishings are all new. The rooms are steam-heated and fitted with both gas and electric lights. There are mirrors in front of which the girls can arrange their hair." Unquote. While G. Fox had been expanding into the Averill building, there had also been some changes just to the north in the William H. Post building. This 1890s view shows the 1881 G. Fox building, the Averill building, and the Woolworth store that had replaced the Talcott house. Next door, the William H. Post carpet and home furnishings store went bankrupt in 1892. Two years later, Post would start a new store, the William H. Post Carpet Company on Asylum Street. The former Post building was taken over by a new company, Neil Goff and Inglis. They started in a similar line of business to their predecessor, but soon introduced a line of furniture and later expanded to include dry goods and women's garments. The store also experienced a damaging fire on November 4, 1894. The Metropolitan Boarding House was still operating on the building's upper floors. In a dramatic scene witnessed by the crowd below, two women who'd escaped the burning building through a skylight were able to climb across the roof of the Averill building, all the way to the edge of the neighboring G. Fox building. They were eventually rescued through the Averill building's attic. The Neil Goff and Inglis Company rebuilt after the fire, eventually coming to occupy all five floors of the building and constructing a rear addition in 1897. 
when the luxurious Allen House Hotel at the corner of Asylum and Trumbull Streets was remodeled in 1898-99, to Neil Goff and Inglis had the contract to provide all of the furniture, carpets, and draperies, including those of the sumptuous Moorish Room, which was one of the hotel's highlights. In 1913, in a $500,000 real estate transaction, G. Fox acquired the building and the entire stock of Neil Goff and Inglis. Foxes sold off the stock in a massive sale. Plans to erect a new 10-story building on the site were never carried out, but G. Fox did occupy the entire four-story building. G. Fox now had a contiguous storefront of approximately 175 feet along Main Street. In 1910, the roof of Fox's 1881 building was raised, replacing the old decorative cornice with a full fifth floor. G. Fox was going from strength to strength, but disaster struck on January 29, 1917. Another fire on a cold night in the dead of winter would destroy the store's Main Street buildings and cost the company about $750,000 in losses. The fire started around 11 p.m. on the first floor and quickly engulfed the entire structure. Every available engine and pumper in the city arrived, and firefighters battled the blaze at close range endangered by falling windows and timbers and the fear that the west wall might crash and fall onto Main Street. Police struggled to control the watching crowds that sometimes surged forward. A few spectators even slipped past the police cordon. The theaters had just let out, and a number of well-dressed men aided the firefighters in setting their hoses. As the Hartford Current reported the next day, on the Talcott Street side of the building, quote, men, women, and children, alert to prevent the spreading of the fire to the tenement houses, stood armed with axes, brooms, and almost everything conceivable to beat out the small fires that repeatedly started as a result of the great sparks that were flying in every direction, unquote. The debris continued to smolder for several days afterwards, and firefighters were called back several times to douse fresh outbreaks. G. Fox and company lay in ruins, but the store would soon rise again, bigger than ever before. To hear about how G. Fox rose from the ashes of the fire and continued its growth into the 1960s, stay tuned for part two of my history of G. Fox and company. You can also check out my book, Vanished Downtown Hartford. It's available from the History Press and various online retailers. Thanks for watching.